Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. Today in the studio, our team correspondent, Simon Bonifant, sits down with the CEO and CTO of a company called Strap. And they have a device that they developed that they claim can replace the white cane. Now, most of us have heard this over the years of gadgets and gadgets and devices that will replace the white cane. Well, they got a product coming out and I suggest taking a listen to it and see what you think about Strap. So without further ado, here's Simon Bonifant and his guests, Ben and Diego from Strap. We hope you enjoy. The amazing technology that is similar to the technologies used for self-driving cars, the sensor technology, to create a way for the blind to have a device that sees for them and then talks to them, tells them what's coming. How's possible that almost a century, nothing has changed? So I decided to do something for the vision of the community. It started like a personal project. Imagine a hockey puck that uh, is strapped to your chest. I would say Iron Man, if anyone has heard about Iron Man, the comic book character. But it's a hockey puck-sized container of sensors, so an array of sensors. And these sensors are different types. We've looked at ultrasonic, we've looked at LiDAR, we've looked at radar. You can look at that at the website, which is strap.tech slash preorders. We're converting the vision sensors into haptic language to take the place of actual vision and your brain response. Hello, everyone on Blind Abilities. This is Simon Bonifant here. And today in the virtual studio, I'm talking to Ben Einan and Diego Roll, and they're from the company Strap. So how are you folks doing today? Really well. Thank you for having us. Very good as well. Thank you so much for the invitation. Oh, my pleasure. Very nice to have you on. It's great to finally meet. And Diego, you're the founder and CEO, and Ben, you're the CTO. Firstly, tell the listeners what Strap is. Of course. Strap is the world first straw replacement of the white cane for the visual impaired. And I know that the headline it may sound like a little bit like, hey, no way, that's impossible. But this is a wearable device that has a bunch of sensors on the chest and can detect any kind of obstacle talking about obstacles in the head area, in the chest area, even in the floor, including bumps, holes, and stairs. And it notifies the user by haptic feedback embedded in the wearable. So depending where is the, what kind of pattern, the vibration, and the location of the haptic feedback, it means where is the obstacle, how far it is from the user, and how to avoid it. As long as other features that we can talk along later in the podcast, we aim to provide a little bit more independence to the visual impaired community. So to reduce the gap from people who cannot see and people who can see. So our goal is to make both groups to be able to make the same activities with the same amount of effort that we reduce the gap of of effort between those who can and those who cannot see. Okay. And when was the company founded and how did you get involved? And can you kind of give a little background and kind of how you got into the blindness field? So the company was founded uh, on four years ago. But that came four years ago. We have been formally operating as a business since 2018. And we have been three years developing the technology, which until today is fully developed. The R&D is finished. And right now we are preparing for mass manufacturing in summer. Ben, do you want to talk about your background and your story? Sure. I met Diego right as the pandemic started, actually, just before the pandemic was locked down. I met Diego and was just immediately connected with both my head and my heart. I'm an engineer by training 30 plus years in the semiconductor industry, making microchips. So I love engineering problems. uh, And that was full of all kinds of challenges. But when I met Diego, I heard the amazing technology that he had created and he just needed someone to help refine it and get it ready for manufacturing. That was my head part, the engineering side of me. But my heart was immediately connected because when I was a teenager, my grandfather went blind and I was able to help him through the process by creating helpful aids and devices to help him see as much as possible uh, before he went totally blind. From then on, I had a heart for helping those who couldn't see. I can see, but my heart is with those who are blind. When I heard about Diego's product that he's creating, the amazing technology that is similar to the technologies used for automatic self-driving cars, the sensor technology, and the opportunity to create a way for the blind to have a device that sees for them and then talks to them, tells them what's coming or what's in the way through haptic sensors. I thought that was 
was a great idea, had incredible potential and promise. So I'm thrilled to be a part of the company now. I joined the company in September, beginning of September, as the chief technology officer. Great. Coming back to you, Diego, how did you first get the idea for the product? And how did you find out that this is a need that blind people would need and would benefit the blind? Everything started around... Way, way years ago, when I was 10 years old, I was with my mom in a supermarket. I saw a person with a mobility impairment, but at the moment, at 10 years old, the truth is, I, I think I didn't, didn't even knew impairments existed. So I was kind of like, wow, like, wow, who is this guy? Why he has a walker? Like, he's super young. And plus a walker, he was stroke survivor. So he has his right arm or left, I don't remember, but one of his arms was like paralyzed. So he was unable to move the arm easily so he had a kind of attachment on the on the elbow who helped him to grab one end of the walker and he grabbed the walker with the other end because along the stroke survivor his legs had some issue and i, I keep staring at this guy like he, he gave my curiosity since it was the first time i saw something like that and minutes later this guy tried to grab an apple he had in front and he could not and at that moment i was kind of in shock because i was thinking to myself like hey how is possible that something that is so easy to do for me or for any of us in the virtual studio right now, like grabbing an apple, for that person was nearly impossible. He needed to ask for help to be able to grab an apple, put it in a bag and to the cart. And, and again, I was like amazed. And that day I make a personal promise that today is literally changing my life. And I promised myself that someday I will do something to make that person be able to grab that apple again with the same facility I was able to. The truth is, Simon, Jeff, I forgot about it. I didn't, th- I didn't think about that in the future until around six to seven years later, I had a kind of a flashback and that memory suddenly came to the top of my mind again. And I was like, okay, like, no way. I just remember this. And so I decided to, to do a small research on Google. And I started to, to research and to read a, a lot of blogs and articles and stuff about mobility impairment. And I found out that for mobility impairment, there's a lot out there. And there's big corporations using millions of dollars, trying to do exoskeletons and trying to do a bunch of different things like that. But I continue my research and I I don't even remember how, but I I ended up with a World Health Organization article stating that every five seconds, someone in the the world lost their sight and that we have more than 300 visually impaired people in the world. And I keep digging on this topic, on the visual uh, impairment. And then I found out that the white cane for the visual impairment was made in 1921. And we're in 2020, nothing had changed. And I was wondering myself again, like, oh my God, how is possible that the tool where 300 million persons in the world daily deposit their life has not been updated for the world of today? Everything has changed. The way we move our cars, the way we dress our phones, the construction we do, all our gadgets, just everything has evolved. How is it possible that almost a century, nothing has changed? So I decided to do something for the visual impaired community. It started like a personal project. Since I was seven years old, I have been studying robotics and technology. And so I, I was learning a bunch of technology. I, I'm, I'm also self, self-taught in robotics. Like I learned around seven programming languages through YouTube and electronics and how to make PCBs and all, all this kind of stuff. So I decided to do something as a personal project because I had at the moment a lot of free time. But like the project started to grow a little bit. And then I started to try this device with different visual impaired friends I knew like friends of friends and stuff, some contacts. And like, they gave me like a huge list of things to change. Like, hey, I like these, but you need to change like a bunch of stuff. And they gave me a huge list. And I correct that features. I make the changes. I iterate with a feedback. And after that, they make another another testing round and another one, another one. And after the four or five testing round, there was a guy called Enrique. He was 15 years old and he was born blind. And his mom was making company to him on the... Uh, trial and the testing round and we met in a park in in a, in a local park so Enrique tried the device he put it on he was able to walk on the park avoid people avoid dogs avoid trees he noticed some bumps and holes on the floor and he was almost running he was super amazed he was super happy and after the testing round his mother uh, went to me and asked him like hey Diego I have never seen my kid walk that fast nor that happy how much is it i want to take this home and i was like 
oh my god like hey it's the only prototype i have it's not working it's not fully working has a bunch of of, of stuff to do and it's it's put it together with glue you know like i cannot give it to you but that validates something really important like hey there was someone that wanted this and that's where my my mind turned on like like a light bulb and i say hey What if we do this for everyone, for all the visually impaired people who want it? Because of a mentor at the moment, I found entrepreneurship. I started to be involved in all this ecosystem about startups and raising capital and hardware startups and manufacturing processes and team and all of this, a pitch deck, a pitch, a little bit, elevator pitch, what it takes to build a startup. So I started to, to get uh, really involved on this topic. I started to went to networking events, pitching events and stuff. And that's how I discovered the entrepreneurship or the startup world as the best channel or the best bridge to be able to, to solve two problems that I have. The first problem is that I wanted these two to become for the blind, for, for them, to make everyone who wants it, to make them able to, to have access to one. And second, to have the resources and the, and the people I needed to do the device because there was a moment where the technology and the things that beta testers wanted to change, my technology capabilities were not enough to make that changes. They require way more expertise on certain areas of electronics, programming and stuff. So I found this startup ecosystem as a perfect breed to solve these two problems. And here we are. So Ben, can you kind of walk us through the technical side of things here? And you mentioned that it uses the haptics and vibrations to tell the user feedback. What is the technology that goes into the back end of making something like this? And how does it detect different obstacles? What is the engineering and technical side of it? Sure. First of all, it is a wearable. Imagine a hockey puck that uh, is strapped to your chest. I would say Iron Man, if anyone has heard about Iron Man, the comic book character. But it's a hockey puck-sized container of sensors. To an array of sensors. And these sensors are different types. We've looked at ultrasonic, we've looked at LIDAR, we've looked at radar, and we're finalizing the sensor choices, like what capabilities they have, which way they should be pointed, and what kinds of uh, information they can gather, basically replacing sight. So we need, we need the best vision in the down direction, where the feet are going, and then we need very good awareness of what's coming up in the forward direction at the chest level. And then, of course, we need something to uh, alert the wearer of any kind of an obstacle at the head level or, or you know, above above the uh, above the torso. It's all forward direction, uh, forward and side. So there's nothing backward looking yet. But, you know, future, future ideas we have for 360 view, things like that. But for right now, we wanted to replace the white cane. So pointing the sensors in the direction of the wh how a user would use a cane uh, to the floor, to the sides, and then even including the upper vision as well. We can then take the signals that come from these sensors and convert them through our electronics, our PCB full of, of chips and, and other components that convert these signals to export them to haptic sensors. And a haptic sensor is a vibration sensor. If you've ridden in any kind of vehicle that has a vibration sensor that lets the driver know that it's going out of its lane, if you've heard about that, that's, that's what it's like. So one type of sensor is they vibrate. There's another type of haptic sensor that pokes, like a finger poking you. Not hard, but just a, it's a different kind of sensation. So with those two basic haptic sensors or haptic devices, we can put them in the device itself on the back, so where it contacts your chest. And we can also put these sensors in the straps that go over your shoulders and around your midsection to hold the, the device to your chest. We can embed these haptic sensors in the straps as well. For example, if a tree limb is hanging down on the upper left side of your path, the upper left haptic sensor would vibrate in your strap to say, hey, it's, it's up near your head. Make sure you slow down or duck. I just let you know it's there. And for example, if you're coming to a stairwell and it, the stairs go up, then we can have haptic sensors that poke, that start at the chest level and kind of poke up the straps, for example. And if the stairs are short steps, they will go up, up, up. And if they're long steps, they will go up, If you can get the idea of my... So what we're doing right now is we're creating, we're actually creating a haptic language for the first time. And we're trying to make it as intuitive as possible so that wearers can intuitively know what's coming, what's in their path, 
where things are by feeling these haptic sensations that our device will transmit. If nothing is in the way, the device will be quiet and you'll just walk along. But if there is something in your way, it will start to alert you. Our plan is to have it when it's quite a distance away, it will start to alert you softly that something's coming. And then as you get closer, the intensity will increase and then you'll know to move left or right or stop. We're converting the vision sensors into haptic language to take the place of actual vision and your brain response. We're now we're now helping you get a similar brain response, but from physical haptic sensors sensed through your skin. Uh, you had mentioned that it takes a pretty short time for the blind user to learn these haptic vibrations. So if I was, was trying this device out, can you kind of take the listeners through how you would show me the vibrations and how you would get me to understand Yes, we have a, it's a two minute audio tutorial that that we have created. So if you buy the device and open the box and and put it on and turn the power on, we include an earbud that you connect to the device and you can listen to the instructions. The instructions are explaining what it will do, but then it also gives you examples. It says, for example, if there's something up and to the left, you'll feel a sensation here. And then we send a signal to that haptic sensor. So you get you start to get the idea through this two minute tutorial of how the, the device actually works. And you actually feel the haptic sensors during this two minute training. After that, I would imagine people would keep their white cane and try this at the same time and just sort of get the feel of things. But you really, once you understand where the haptics are located on the straps and how they interact after the two-minute tutorial, it's it's very possible you could set your white cane down immediately and start walking around perhaps in an area that you already know and just see how it works and say, I know the chair is here, so let's just see how this thing would see the chair that I already know is here. And you can in the house or something or on the back porch. So you can kind of get a sense that way. And then pretty soon you're walking, you're just moving around after seeing how it works with a few known things and off you go. I was in Guadalajara in September and we had a test a, a test pilot who, who is uh, totally blind and he, in front of me now, he's, he tried the device on and uh, was, was walking around the kind of courtyard area of our building in Guadalajara. And then he got so excited. He said, I want to try this out on, on the sidewalk. So we looked at each other at the, as a team and said, okay. And he led us out onto the sidewalk and started walking quickly down the sidewalk and was telling us what he was feeling and seeing like a test pilot, just saying, oh, I see there's something at my left. And sure enough, there was a planter on the, on the sidewalk. A tree was growing out of it. And he saw it. He felt it through the haptics. Uh, he noticed a chain that was hanging on the right side of him later down the sidewalk. So he was seeing things, of course. But what he was so excited about was that he was moving quickly. He was walking faster than he ever had with the white cane. And one of the funniest things that I thought, I mean, we were just all so happy and amused with him was that he was going up the stairs and he had a glass of iced tea in his hand, like a bottle, a bottle of iced tea. And he was able to hold the rail for the stairs with the other hand. The strap device told him there's stairs here. So he was drinking his iced tea, holding the rail because he could. He didn't have to have one hand on the white cane. He was so happy that he could drink an iced tea and hold the rail and still go up the stairs. Really nice. It must be a very freeing feeling if you'd be able to, uh, to do that. Right? Absolutely. So when a user wears a device, is it visible to other sighted people or is it or in a place where they could not see it? Yes, you wear this wearable outside the clothes. So yes, uh, other, other persons can see the device, but the device is designed that really seamless so if you don't know what it is you think it's a fashion it's as part of your your outfit of, of the day so it's super seamless uh you can wear it with anything you want uh, you can put jackets uh, you can have winter clothes or summer clothes and doesn't matter so yes it, it, other persons can see it but it's so seamless and it's so so slim and so well designed that it seems like parts of your outfit again like an accessory and it's super lightweight and super comfortable as a user you also forget you have it on okay wow the straps are elastic and they're quite wide and so so they they feel comfortable they are adjustable as well so you can get it to to fit nicely to you such that it's not too tight but it's contacting you so that you do feel the haptic sensors easily. So it's just a nice, comfortable fit, as Diego said. Oh, okay, great. I think one of the things that I would kind of have a question about, and, and I'm sure some listeners would, is if I was crossing a street with this and, you know, the cars, I think the white cane is really used as an identifier for the sighted 
population to see that black people are blind and we have king. So if I was crossing the street with this and cars wouldn't see this, I mean, would they think that I was someone sighted crossing the street? Because that could certainly cause a problem in that regard. Yes, there is no cane anymore. So the uh, person looks like any other person walking across the street. We have several ideas and Diego can probably comment on even more. But one of them is to also wear an armband that uh, is an identifier as a way to help telegraph visually to the sighted people that you can't see, but you are wearing a device that helps you move around. And uh, so anyway, that's one one way we thought it was. So we have made some arm armbands and uh, as ex first examples of how we would do such a thing. Okay. So you had mentioned that I believe that you're in the pre-order stage. So we'll talk about the price in a minute, but, but what's the status of uh, when the device is going to actually be hanging the market? Uh, when they can order it. Yes, uh, so right now we launched our pre-orders a couple of months ago. You can look at that at the website, which is strap.tech slash pre-orders. So right now we are uh, having a discount. So the, the the price of the market, it's of $750. But right now we have a discount to $500. But you don't need to pay full to be able to, to secure your unit. You just need to pay an upfront fee of $50, which with that you save your device. And when we are ready to ship, you will pay the rest of the money. And we are delivering the first units in summer. And after that, we are going to take away the discount, make the price again of $750. Uh, anyone can have access to that worldwide shipping. So anywhere you are, you can pre-order or order it uh, after some. Okay. So so after the first couple of devices are shipped, you're planning to take away the discounted price. So so it sounds like if someone wanted to uh, pre-order the device, it sounds like they would do that now and they'd be able to take advantage of the discount. Yeah, $50 down and then it holds the device for you for when we release it. That's right. Okay, great. And how is the battery on the device? Can you talk about that? Yeah, a lot of people are concerned about that. And our goal is to have a minimum of 24-hour battery. As I said, we're, well, I may not have said it exactly, but we're in the final processes of choosing the sensors. And we have ways to manage battery life, like uh, art battery management. So we feel like we can hit this target easily. And then this device becomes sort of like a cell phone or, or sort of like you know a, a mobile device that you have now that when you go to sleep, you just just put it on the charger and then it's ready for you for the whole next day. That's the goal. If we can increase the battery life to more than 24 hours, we sure will. It's, you know, more battery life is better, but that's, that's kind of the goal right now. There are some prototypes that we've built so far. They're not the exact version we're going to have, and they don't have the smart battery management. But my estimation is around 18 hours, between 18 and 24 is already achieved by this prototype. So we feel very confident that we can hit the, the full day, the 24 hours. Okay, great. Diego, can you describe how the charger works and how would the user uh, plug it in? Yes, of course. So we have a, a unique magnetic charger embedded because uh, sometimes uh, when, like without seeing, it, it may be difficult to to have the orientation right the first time of the connector or just to find the hole where you need to plug it in. So this is a super intuitive, super easy uh, magnetic, the magnetic charger where you just, uh, like, like the oldest MacBook Pros, where you just uh, put nearby the cable and almost by magic, it's plugging in and, and fully and charging. Okay, great. So if someone wanted to contact you to either find your website or to send you an email, can you provide the contact information? Our email is hello at strap.tech. Uh, our website, again, is strap.tech. And our social media is at strap.technologies. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Medium. Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming on to Blind Abilities and talking to our listeners about your technology. And we hope to how it will evolve and grow in the future. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And it's nice to, to speak with you and get to know your company. Well, thank you for having us. We're very excited for the project itself, but we're even more excited about what it's going to do for the visually impaired community. So thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to announce this to everyone. And then we're, we'll be working hard for the, the next many months uh, this, this coming year to get to the, to the manufacturing stage and then get it ready for everybody by the summer. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Diego. And thanks for what you're doing for the blindness community at Strap. It's going to be exciting to see this product, kick it around the block a couple times, and see how it works. And if you want to find out more about Strap, check them out on the web at strap.tech. And if you have any feedback you want to give us, give us a call at 612-367-9063. We'd love to hear from you. 
And for more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com, on Twitter at BlindAbilities, and download the free Blind Abilities app from the App Store. That's two words, Blind Abilities. And from all of us here at Blind Abilities, to you, your family, and friends, through these challenging times, stay safe, stay aware, and stay well. I want to thank you for listening, and until next time, bye-bye. When we share what we see through each other's eyes, eyes, we can then then begin begin to bridge bridge the the gap between between the limited limited expectations and the reality reality of blind abilities. abilities.